I've learned that I miss the sound of applause at the end of songs. Like, it's a weird thing. Like, I, I really feel like it's awkward, you know, when you're just playing to like, basically it feels like no one and you finish a song and then there's this moment of silence for me and just kind of look at each other like, well, on to the next song. Luckily, I'm quarantined with the other half of my band. So we've been playing nonstop and working on an album. And <clears throat> at the beginning of the quarantine, when we thought it was only like gonna be like a month or so, we were doing a live stream a week. And then once we were like, you know, okay, this is here to stay for a minute. Now we've been kind of going once a month. And now we're working with a company called Oxcord, which is actually founded by James Casey of, of Trey Anastasio Band. Um, and it's it's a paid platform. So like we sell tickets and the audio and video quality is so much better. For my own touring stuff, I think we're looking at spring next year. The good thing is like being part of a duo, I think we'll be some of the first shows to go because we're in the same quarantine bubble and we could drive to a gig in one car and, you know, kind of limit, <clears throat> you know, the the risk there. For Tab, I think everyone's kind of just waiting until, cause it's such a big, you know, there's so many moving parts. I think we're kind of just waiting to see where everything lands. <laughs> what is the first indulgent purchase you'd make if you won the lottery? Oh. Again, I want indulgent. I don't want, I'm gonna help people. I don't want anything altruistic, be selfish. Oh man, I mean, I wanna get, I, want, I would totally buy like a mansion first and foremost. Like I live in a studio apartment in New York City normally. So I, the space to, you know, have my own practice studio is like on the top of my list. Do you think that living in New York City will still be as important when this is all over? Oh yeah, I mean, I still have my apartment there. It's just that because there's not really any music going on, I'd rather be close to my family and my boyfriend out here. So that's kind of why I'm hiding out until coronavirus is, you know, a thing of the past. I probably over romanticize New York City in terms of like jazz. Are you still able to go out in New York and just find cool jams that are happening? Yeah, there's a lot going on. I mean, I, I think I over romanticize it too because I'm always like missing it when I'm not there. And then when I'm there, like the reality of like the weather and like getting on a subway and like dealing with, you know, the crowds is like not my favorite thing, but it, it more than makes up for it with all the musical goodness that's there. You play like jam music with Trey and then you kind of do this other thing. And I've long been saying that there should be some sort of blending of Latin music and the jam scene mm -hmm. and I haven't seen it. Well, I mean, there is a little bit of that in Tab for sure. I mean, and that's part of why I think I was a good candidate for getting the job, you know, 10 years ago, because I came up in playing salsa bands, playing Brazilian music here in the Bay Area. And um, Ciro Baptista has been like a longtime collaborator of Trey's. And so there are some grooves and some moments um, in songs that are totally taken from that tradition. Um, whether like the people listening and enjoying the music know that is not so important really, but it's there, you know, that ingredient is around. And, and especially now that Ciro's back in the band and James plays great percussion and I, you know, know that style of music really well, there's been some more like kind of digging in in that direction in certain songs, like definitely some grooves that like come straight from Brazil, you know, done in, in the more jam context with, you know, different sounds and you know more kind of open-ended solos than you might have um in the like original source but it, it's cool to see all those ingredients mix and even though like the music i do on the outside of tab is so different um to me it's like a similar um approach as trace is like kind of putting everything in a blender and not being so um you know so uh obsessed with needing to put like color within the lines of a certain genre. Do you have a tattoo? If so, what was your first? Uh, yeah, I do. I have two tattoos. Uh, the first tattoo um, I got when I was 18 and actually my mom was going to get one with me, but she chickened out. Um, but she totally was, was down with it. It wasn't like a rebellious thing at all. And it's a, it's a lotus um, with an own symbol on it, kind of just kind of reminding me to breathe and pop, you know, not not stress out except that i put it on my <laughs> my shoulder so i can't see it so i guess it's for other people to remember to 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 breathe it's so weird isn't it right that we just don't really think enough to breathe that we have to remind ourselves do you think that's a modern yeah life thing? definitely i think a modern and very american thing i think there's other cultures that really value um taking your time <laughs>
and I mean, I think we just kind of put a lot of pressure on ourselves to um, to feel like we're achieving something, and you know what, and success, what success looks like has become kind of this elusive thing that's tied to kind of fame and fortune, and really those um, parameters are totally movable. Well, what did success mean to you ten years ago versus now? Yeah, I mean, I think success as a as a young person wanting to you know make a career in music it was much more not I wouldn't say shallow because I've always been in music for for deeper reasons but you know the big goals were like record deal from winning a Grammy you know big things that really if you set yourself up for that being the only indicator of your own success you might spend a lot of the time disappointed or really stressed out and there's so much in the music business that's like out of your control and a, a big part of it is just being lucky um, and you know it's not just the time you put in on your instrument or the time you spend creating so I've really shifted it into you know wanting to make people feel good with the music I'm putting out there and staying true to myself and um, you know doing what makes me happy will have a better effect on the people around me than being disappointed that you know I'm not out there like playing to thousands of people with my own music because that was really the goal and when I was young but I love I love the audiences of like a hundred and, and even less people when I can really feel the vibe of an intimate room. So it's really changed a lot for me what what I consider a successful show to be, what a su successful year looks like, and what a successful career is for me is different than probably the next person you'll interview. Yes, but it's interesting because you're doing these audienceless live audienceless shows now, and mm -hmm. when you're when one is an artist, validation is important in some respect whether we want to yeah. admit it or not we want validation that what we're doing means something and maybe that plays out later on when there are audiences yeah i mean i think whatever you can do to to let your identity be something that isn't dependent on other people the happier you'll be you know so i i think all of us have had a reckoning with that as artists during the quarantine because we've really just been you know our industry has been kind of put completely on pause or even like in a way wiped out for the time being and so if you're looking for external validation it's not a very good time to be a musician but if you're focusing on wow i really love waking up and doing this every day and creating and putting out content that matters to me and i'm going for like the quality of my audience rather than the quantity then there is a way to be happy for sure